Shalom. We are continuing in the Gospel according to John. We are investigating the Hebraic background of the Gospel, and today we are in chapter 12. Then Yeshua, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Yeshua, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bore what was put therein. So we have a time stamp on what day this is. It's six days before the Passover. The Passover will be on the 14th. Therefore, this is the day, the eighth day of the calendar month. In accordance with Exodus, the lamb that will be slaughtered for the Passover must come into the house and be kept there on the 10th. So this is two days before that. We are going to see that Yeshua will be with the people and examined by the people over the next few days. In two days, he will be making his entry into Jerusalem. It will be on a Sunday. Now Yeshua is going to explain in the next verse that she is anointing his body for burial. And we read in the Talmud that this is one of the actions that is actually allowed on Shabbat. Since he is there for a Friday night meal, we know that it is the Sabbath. It is written in the Talmud, One may perform all the needs of the dead on Shabbat. One may smear oil on the body and rinse it with water. And all of this is permitted, provided that one does not move any of its limbs, which would constitute a violation of the laws of set-aside objects, if the person were actually dead. When necessary, one may also remove a pillow from beneath it, and thereby place it on cold sand in order to delay its decomposition. In other words, if the person dies, actually on Sabbath, we can't bury them on that very day. Similarly, one may tie the jaw of a corpse that is in the process of opening. One may not move it directly so that it will rise back to its original position, but so that it will not continue to open. And similarly, if one has a roof beam that is broken on Shabbat, one may support it with a bench or long poles from a bed. One may not move it so that the beam will rise back to its original place, making a parallel with the person with the open mouth, but so that it will not continue to fall. One may not shut the eyes of the dead on Shabbat because the body is set aside. So we see that no one objects to her action. And even after he says, she's anointing my body for death, which they still don't understand, the only thing that is objected to is by Judas, and that is the cost of the ointment. Continuing in verse 7, Then said Yeshua, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Yeshua's sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Yeshua. On the next day much people were come to the feast, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. So we see the priests are now beginning to examine him just as they would be examining the lamb, the Passover lamb. So the question of the poor, always being with you, is in Deuteronomy 15:11. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide unto your brother, to your poor, and to your needy in your land. So speaking of the tenth day of the lamb coming into the house on the tenth day. Exodus 12:3 Speak unto all the congregation of Israel saying In the 10th day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for a house So Yeshua is the Passover lamb and he is now in the house The activities with the palm branches are associated generally with Sukkot. So there has always been a question whether the Messiah would actually come in the month of Nisan, the Passover month, which we're reading about now, 
or the month of Tishrei, the Sukkot month, which is associated with the palm trees. Rebbe Eliezer said, in Nisan, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt, and in Tishrei, in the future, the Jewish people will be redeemed in the final redemption with the coming of Messiah. Rabbi Joshua said, in Nisan they were redeemed, and in Nisan they will be redeemed in the time to come. So if the people are expecting Messiah, or they're expecting a king to come, either month would be viable in their thought about that. It is Passover, but we're going to see them do a Sukkot observance. Part of the Sukkot observance is from Psalm 118. Save now, I beseech you, Yehovah. Yehovah, I beseech you, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of Yehovah. We have blessed you out of the house of Yehovah. So that phrase, save now, in Hebrew is Hoshanna. And where in the recitation of Hallel, this is the series of Psalms, would they wave the lulav, that would be the palm branches. They would do so at the verse, thank the Lord for he is good, from Psalms 118, that appears at both the beginning and end of the psalm, and at the verse, Lord, please save us, Hoshana. This is the statement of Beth Hillel, the commentator. Beth Shemai say, they would wave the lulav even at the verse, Lord, please grant us success. So we see this is definitely associated with the festival, the celebration of Sukkot, and they're practicing it even though we're in the month of Passover. Another association you see with the palm branches and Sukkot is in 2 Maccabees 10.10. And they took the willows of the brook and the branches of palm trees, and they sang a song of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, who gave them courage and salvation to purify the temple of his holiness. Remember, the Maccabees were celebrating their victory. It was the time of the winter. It was Hanukkah, but they were celebrating Sukkot because they had missed it the few months before that. Another thing I just want to look at, although it's not mentioned in John, in the other Gospels, it says that the people threw their garments on the ground as Yeshua came forward on the donkey. And we see that in uh, 2 Kings 9.13. Then they hasted and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with trumpets, saying, Yehu is king. So at the crowning of the king, the people put the garments on the ground. Continuing the text, verse 14. And Yeshua, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes, sitting on an ass's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first, but when Yeshua was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that were with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bore record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Do you perceive how you prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. So they are remembering the verse from Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So there is a very old commentary from the Talmud that specifically says, If the Jewish people merit redemption, the Messiah will come in a miraculous manner with the clouds of heaven, as we see written elsewhere. If they do not merit redemption, the Messiah will come lowly and riding upon a donkey. And many centuries later, Rashi made this a similar comment. Behold, your king shall come unto you. It is impossible to interpret this except as referring to the king Messiah, as it is stated, and his rule shall be from sea to sea. We do not find that Israel had such a ruler during the days of the second temple. So Rashi is about the 12th century. So even after all those years and all the Christian defense of Yeshua being the Messiah, having filled this Zechariah prophecy, Rashi still clung to the idea that the Zechariah prophecy is about a coming Messiah for him, although he rejected Yeshua as the Messiah. Continuing in verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Yeshua. Philip came and told Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip told Yeshua. And Yeshua answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life should lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So now we see an additional examination. The Greeks are also going to examine Yeshua, the Passover lamb. In verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came unto this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Yeshua answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. And he has already mentioned this twice in John 3.14 and in John 8.28, that he would be lifted up. And this refers back to, as we said before, the passage in Numbers 21.8-9, where the people are attacked by serpents in the wilderness. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on a pole. And it came to pass, that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Looking deeply into this concept, we see that Yeshua can both save you, and heal you, and also condemn you to death. From verse 34, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Messiah abides forever. And how do you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Yeshua said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in darkness does not know whither he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be the children of light. These things spoke Yeshua and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they did not believe on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The first Isaiah quote is from 53.1, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of Jehovah been revealed? The second is from Isaiah 6.10, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. One interesting thing about this is that Yeshua cites Isaiah twice. He says, Isaiah said this, and that Isaiah said that. And there are people who think that there is more than one Isaiah, but clearly he thought that it was the same Isaiah. Inserted here, the translation, Targum Jonathan, of Isaiah 6.10. Make the heart of this people fat make their ears heavy and darken their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and repent and it shall be forgiven them. So the idea of being converted is associated with the idea of repenting and the idea of being healed is associated with the forgiveness of sins. Continuing in verse 44, Yeshua cried and said, He that believes on me does not believe on me, but on him that sent me. And he that sees me, sees him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words, and believe not, I do not judge him. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejects me, and does not receive my words, has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, 
what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Next time we enter the season of the Passover. Until then, Tasimita Enayim al Keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.